So this is uh, our first tour where uh, we actually did this tour uh, about seven weeks ago and we're restarting the tours over again. And so this is the first tour of the walking tour season that we did uh, seven weeks ago. And this is our Esther Short neighborhood tour. And what we'll be doing is we'll be uh, taking a walk through uh, this beautiful neighborhood down here and actually looking at the historic homes that are still standing in this location that is uh, pretty much uh, somewhat the pioneer area of uh, Vancouver, the city. Now we start here because we're going to take a look here at Mr. George Vancouver. And he's actually the individual that has the city's uh, name after. Now the interesting thing about Vancouver is he never actually saw the little uh, curve in the river that was eventually named for him as a city. What it was is he actually sent one of his uh, lieutenants down the river to explore the Columbia once they saw the mouth and they went down on a smaller boat and they headed down the river and eventually came to this point where they stopped and his lieutenant actually named it for his captain of the ship. And it was about, uh, about 30 to 40 years after that that the settlement of Vancouver really started to get uh, started. And so we're going to go ahead and walk across the street and we're going to take a look at one of the first elegant homes in this early town of Vancouver. And we'll take a look at this wonderful house right here. Now the first thing I'm going to point out about this house is that this isn't the original place where this house stood. This house actually originally stood just one block south of here, right where the city hall is now standing. And the reason why this house still exists is that during the urban renewal period, they actually uh, tore down a lot of the historic homes in this area to build new uh, facilities and to clear out space for commercial area. But the Slocum House was one of the first elegant mansions in the area, and so it was moved up to this spot and preserved. And in 66, when they moved it, they actually even did a little bit of landscaping. They placed this tree, which is actually very close to the same trees that were in the, uh, the front uh, yard of this house originally. Now this house was built in 1868, uh, um, and the old Slocum House is the only uh, residential home left from uh, the mid-1800s in this area. Now Charles and Laura Slocum uh, purchased this property for 700, or purchased the property down here for $700 from uh, Esther Short. And uh, Charles Slocum and his par par uh, partner actually opened a general store at 3rd and Main in 1860 and they continued to uh, build that business and then eventually he was able to build this home which is actually modeled after uh, Rhode Island style homes. Uh, and during a big fire in 1889, uh, uh, 28 homes in Vancouver were destroyed and this, uh, and, uh, uh, this house was saved from that period at that time. So from here, we're going to go ahead and head down and we're going to talk about the park just a little bit and then we'll take a look at where the brewery used to stand. If I can everyone crowd around, I'm going to go without the speaker, it's a little distorted today, it's a little distracting, so I'll just be real loud, <laughs> shouldn't be too bad. So if we turn around and we take a look here at Esther Short Park, and now this park was established in 1853 and it's the oldest public park in the west, and this is uh, part of the original land claim made by Amos and Esther Short. Now Amos and Esther Short were the ones who actually platted the city of Vancouver, the original plat. Now there's an interesting story about that. The original claim stretched from Main Street to the uh, west to the river and from Fourth Plain south to the river. And it was actually originally held by an individual, individual named Henry Williamson. Uh, he filed the claim in 1845. But Williamson left soon after filing his claim and went back to uh, the Midwest where he was going to marry his fiance. Now he returned a, a couple years later unmarried, which we're not sure what happened with that, but his claim had actually been jumped by the shorts and he had lost his, uh, his rights to the land. So soon after that, he decided to not fight that and he left to California and he was never heard from again. But the shorts continued to have this land and they sold this land off to many different individuals and then eventually they donated this large land of dedicated this park for Esther Short. And this was actually, this park was the first site of the first Clark County Fair. And we actually have photos in our collection of the fair that you can see uh, from, from that time. So from here we'll go and walk and we're going to talk about this building, but we're going to talk about what used to be there. 
So how many people in the crowd remember Lucky Lager Brewery? Oh, yeah. yeah, remember Lucky Lager, right? Lucky Lager actually started as early, well not Lucky Lager itself, but a brewery in this area started as early as 1857. And one of the early brewers in Vancouver was, a, was an individual who started a little brewery in the area called Henry, named Henry Weinhardt. Now, Weinhardt operated his brewery in this area for a little while after he had tried to establish a brewery in Oregon and had failed. Well, he eventually established one in Vancouver and it did pretty well. And so he uh, eventually sold it off to some local businessmen and then he moved back to Oregon and then all of that is history at this point as we know. But uh, on this site, for since the late 19th century, there had been a brewery. Originally, the Vancouver Brewery, then the Star Brewery, and then the Interstate Brewery. And many different prominent citizens from Vancouver were involved in uh, the operation of this brewery. And then eventually, Lucky Lager took this over. And it was a Lucky Lager brewery from the mid 20th century until the 1980s. The interesting story about this site is that in the late 70s, Lucky Lager had actually made a deal with the city of Vancouver to get this land, the land to the north, and then the land to the uh, northwest, and they were gonna build their, their national, international headquarters here in Vancouver, Washington. So the city made a deal for the land, and Lucky Lager went ahead and they actually uh, tore down the buildings that were on the, uh, the, the street to the north, and then the one to the northwest, but unfortunately the economy stalled and Lager wasn't able to do this and eventually Lager closed shop and left town and a lot of these plots were left. And we're actually gonna go up and look at that plot that's left and see what the city's trying to do to rejuvenate that and then talk about uh, just a couple of the items that were up or a couple of the buildings that were up at that site. So we're talking about the sign here the Lucky Lager, there used to be a big kind of cursive looking stylized L that they had at the top of the building and the Washington State Historical Society actually holds that, uh, that, that artifact. So it's still in existence. Um, and uh, I was, I was uh, t talking about how when they were gonna tear down the building, they were trying to figure out what they were gonna do with it. And someone wrote into the Columbian in a little uh, opinion piece that they should place it at the top of the Smith Tower which is the big circular building, because it looked like a beer can. <laughs> we could place it up top. But it ended up being put in storage with the Washington State Historical Society. And we've discussed on a couple occasions, recently we just opened a labor exhibit, and we talk about Lucky Lager, because that was a really large business for the community. Uh, Lucky Lager and then Alcoa, which was an aluminum uh, facility. Those were huge businesses for Clark County in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they both shut down around the same time and we lost a lot of jobs. And so in our labor exhibit, we talk about Lucky Lager and we, we have a press that we have in the middle of our gallery. And we joked about trying to maybe get the lager sign in there, but it would probably touch the roof and wouldn't fit. It's so big, but you know, we can never figure out something to do with it. Hopefully we can get it back out into the public. Now I'll talk about this block a little bit. This block was the block that they took down when they were going to do the facilities and this block actually had a nice elegant home on the northwest end that was owned by a Dr. Wiswald. And uh, Wiswald was a pretty prominent physician in the area and he actually, in the 30s, he was involved in the uh, Clark County Poor Farm, which is up on 78th Street. It's the agricultural WCU, now it's I think a county farm. He was involved up there. He was actually a physician and I've seen letters that people have written to him because what they would do in the 30s is people didn't have any money or anything, you know, no jobs or anything like that and children would get sick and this and that. So they would write to the doctor, you know, I need to have my son have a tonsillectomy or I got hurt on the job. So I need to have, you know, this medicine or whatever. They would write to the physicians and the physicians would say, okay, we'll give you a pass to the county hospital. And then, so Wiswald uh, dictated that. And it's just really interesting seeing those interactions, you know, of like mothers saying, oh, it's so great. The little Johnny got his tonsillectomy. He feels so much better now and this and that. And so Wiswald was in charge of that. And it was a really interesting time in the depression, how they had to try to deal with those things. Now on the other end, you had Cushing Painting, which was a very prominent citizen. And eventually uh, one of his family members became a judge in the area. Um, and he had one of the earliest businesses over there. And so there were a lot of different businesses that were on this block. And there used to be uh, 
from that east end there all the way down there were just big nice old style buildings two-story that they would uh, you know they had car dealerships salvation army was there one time even churches had set up shop in the top of those areas so from here we're going to head up just a block or so and we'll take a look at our next site are we going to go across yeah we're going to go across and as we're standing here i'll point out if you look at this building right over here as we walk across, this used to be a car dealership. And what they've done is they've repurposed this. So now you can go into where it used to be the showroom and you can have a meal. It's a little indoor courtroom or courtyard. So we'll go and pause right here and we'll take a look at this. This is the Hamilton Milan uh, funeral home. And this building was built around 1885 which is interesting because it's been stuccoed over, so it looks quite different than it used to. Um, it looks a little more modern, but yeah, this is an 1885 building. And uh, this building was reportedly built by Samuel Brown, a civic leader and businessman that lived here in the 1890s. Uh, and Brown was actually the father of an individual named Charles Brown, which we'll actually see Charles House later. And uh, there's a little bit of a sad story surrounding Charles. Now, President Lincoln appointed Brown county treasurer in uh, 1861, a position that he served in for 21 years. And uh, wearing many hats during this period, Brown also served as mayor of Vancouver for two terms beginning in 1861. And Brown uh, died in uh, 1908, um, leaving again his son Charles, which was a well-known businessman, and Charles actually became a mayor also. And this beautiful home was also occupied by William Wallace McCready, uh, prosecuting attorney of Clark County in 1894 to 1896, jub judge of the Superior Court from 1904 until 1909, and then served uh, in state Congress from 1909 until 1911, uh, replacing Francis W. Cushing, which we talked about the Cushing painting, was a descendant of him. And McCready became part owner of the Portland Beavers and helped establish that uh, group when they were here and used his own resources to keep the league together after 1906 San Francisco earthquake. And as Congressman, he appointed John P. Keegan's Jr. Uh, to the Naval Academy. Now, how many people are familiar with John P. Keegan's? Well, the theater. The theater, right? That's all I know. Right? <laughs> John Keegan's was actually a nine-time mayor of Vancouver and he was a, uh, he had, ran a construction business and so he was pretty prominent in the city and he built the Kiggins Theater, but he also built the Castle Theater and a couple others over the time that he was here. And he was a quite prominent citizen. He actually brokered uh, the deal for the, uh, the Archers, uh, Daniel Midland uh, grain facilities. And he worked at a lot of the key points in the early and mid 20th century that really made Vancouver the city that it, it became. So Kiggins uh, is quite an interesting figure. And actually on a couple of the later tours, we talk a little bit more about his history and his past. So from here, we'll go ahead and head up this way and we'll take a look at St. James what is this Church. For now? This is a funeral home. Oh, okay. I guess yep. you said that and I missed it. Has it always been? Oh, okay. uh, it, was a, it was originally a, how, a home. Okay, yeah. Most of the funeral homes in downtown Vancouver were homes originally and then they were turned into funeral homes later. That's, that's an interesting question. And actually, there was, a, there was a good question that was brought up about <coughs> that home over there, if that was the original look of it, if it had been added onto. And the way that we do that at the Historical Society and historians in general, the way we verify those things is we look at old Sanborn insurance maps. And the maps will show from top exactly how the house looks so we can see if those additions are added and whatnot. And unfortunately, the insurance maps don't cover sidewalks very well. So we're never really sure about those little details. But a lot of what we have to do is we have to get like three or four indirect sources of evidence looking at say a site, a home, maybe a, a permit for a building, then the Sanborn map, and then a photo that can really give us an idea to place when these uh, structures were built on, when they were changed, how were they were changed. And this factors in a lot to how these buildings could go on the historical registers too. Because if they're too altered, like if we look uh, at the, me the medical arts building, which is blocked by these buildings over here, I believe, um, the, it's the old brick building on Main Street and it's because it has arts on it because it has a penthouse on top it's not eligible for the register because it's had that major alteration and the windows in front have been altered too and that's the kind of thing we have to look at when we're doing that they have that so we have to wait another 50 years for that stuff to become historic and then we can put it on the register 
So if you want to turn around here, we'll take a look at St. James Church. Now this building was built in 1885. The original, and it's, this, it's just this structure right here. These other two structures were added later. Now the original St. James was actually on the Hudson's Bay Company land. And it was at the site of the fort. And you know, it's not named St. James just for the apostle. It's named St. James for the uh, prime factor, James Douglas of the Hudson's Bay Company, because he was insistent on having the church on the property. And so they named the church in double for after him also. Unfortunately, in the 1850s, when the U.S. government took over the, the barracks area, they asked the church to evacuate the facilities. And so the church had to find some new land and they came out and they purchased this property and they began to build their new church, which was completed in 1885. And this church is interesting because the, uh, one of the fathers that used to work here, he said that he believed that this church was actually modeled after another church that was out in Europe. And that if you look out at this church in Europe, that it's, uh, the design's almost exactly the same. Now, the interesting thing about this architecture with this church here is that this is Gothic Revival. And the reason it's Revival is because all of the elements of it that make it Gothic are just a facade. They're just for show and look. So you have the buttresses that are coming down. Originally, in a Gothic architecture, those would have actually bared more weight. But because of construction technology at the time, they didn't need that, but they still wanted the Gothic style. So those are really just remnants of things that used to be functional, but now they signify that style. So from here, we'll go and head down and we'll take a look at what's uh, currently still the post office. So here we see uh, the first federal post office in Vancouver here, and this was built in 1918. And uh, this post, uh, the, the original Vancouver post office started out in a wooden building on the intersection of 5th and Main. However, it didn't stay there for very long and it bounced around from building to building to building. And that was common. Even uh, we, in later tours, we look at the telephone exchange that was built around in the 1930s. The telephone exchange originally started in buildings that weren't designed for a telephone exchange. They were just as buildings and they said, hey, we have 15 telephones and we need to service them. So they would put it in the facility and then eventually once the city grew enough, just like this, with this case, then they eventually uh, built the facility specific for it. And this was in 1918 when uh, the, this building was placed here. And the city's first federally constructed post office and its construction symbolizes the recognition of the federal government that Vancouver had to become an important regional center. And originally this site belonged to the Catholic Church, but it was acquired from the post office in uh, 1911. And the building's cornerstone was, ceremony was dedicated on February 5th, 1917. Now that's close to a really important other date in Vancouver history. And that's why after the cornerstone laying, it only had a little bit of time to be, you know, the favorite of the town. Because on February 14th, 1917, they opened up the little thing called the Interstate Bridge. <laughs> so it kind of, uh, you know, it kind of got overshadowed, got it show stolen a little bit there. But it's been the main post office for quite some time. For over 50 years, it was the main post office and it's still being used as an annex now. Um, and it's a wonderful example of uh, what's called Beaux-Arts and uh, neoclassical architecture. And it just basically uses the Roman style columns that you see in the front. And there was a uh, previous guide on the tour and she was really into architecture. And she told me that she thought it was kind of strange that the columns were pressed so far up to the building. And she, she had hypothesized that it was maybe the, the post office originally had thought they were gonna have more space and they were gonna build a wider building when they originally did, but that they weren't able to acquire as much land as they wanted. Whether that's true or not, I'm not quite sure, but it's definitely interesting and she was very curious about that. And we continue to endeavor to look for those kinds of things in the historical record if we could find them. Interstate Bridge? Yeah, Interstate Bridge, not I-5, because it actually connected off onto what's Highway 99. Right. Uh, and the interstate wasn't actually built until the 60s. I believe it was 61 when the second span was installed on the bridge. Uh, and then it became I-5 because that's when I-5 was created. And the interesting thing is uh, the bridge tenders, they're the guys who take care of the bridge all the time. And they'll tell you that the span they have the most trouble with is the 1960s span. That 1917 span is just fine. <laughs> they say that's a, that's a good one. So at least that's what I've heard. <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty funny. But yeah, no, it was one lane. And originally when that bridge was built, there was a streetcar that went across and it would go to Jansen Beach area. And so people would ride back and forth. And there was one person that was on a walk one time. It's this nice little anecdote he told me that he had a friend 
that would actually take people on a rowboat across the Columbia to the, uh, to the, uh, to the amusement park that was over there and that he would have tickets or something, and if they kept their tickets, they'd get a free trolley ride back. <laughs> so I don't know if that's true. Seems a pretty uh, robo across that thing, I don't know. But you know, it's an interesting story that people tell about you know, that and the park that used to be over there. So we'll head down and we'll take a look at, uh, at the courthouse, and we'll talk about the previous courthouses. We'll actually pause here real quick, and we'll take a look at the Esther house or the Esther building. So we'll stop right here and we'll take a look at this real quick. Now this building uh, was uh, originally owned by Joe du or George Dubois. Now the Dubois family uh, owned lumber mills and uh, various businesses in the area and they were quite, quite prominent. Um, and uh, this, this site too was also the site of uh, the YWCA for some time in the area. So we'll continue down on the courthouse from here. So this building that we're looking at right here, this was built in 1941, and this is courthouse number four. And this was designed by Day Hilborn. Now, if you've been on previous tours, you may have heard about Hilborn. Hilborn was a very prominent architect in the area. The medical arts building that I referenced, he designed that building. Um, the Kiggins Theater, he designed that building. So Hilborn uh, did all kinds of different styles. The Columbian building, which they're in now, the, uh, the long uh, 1950s one, he designed that building. So he was quite prominent in the area. And so he designed this building in uh, around the 1940s. And this is around the middle of his career. And he roamed to prominence in the, the field of architecture. And he actually got his name in these uh, old books that they used to have. If anyone's familiar, they were called Who's Who. Who's Who in Washington, Who's Who in the United States. And they, they used to take prominent people who were architects, who were lawyers, businessmen, artists, whatever, and they would put them in these books and then you would have it on your shelf and you'd say, well, I wonder who's important. Okay, Mr. Hilborn is important. So you look through those. Uh, and this, the courthouse story begins in 1855 and the county was five years old. Uh, and during those days, the first year, uh, the commissioners met in a private home of probate judge Amos Short. So the shorts, they got around and they did different things. Um, and actually Amos was only around Vancouver for, for just a little time because uh, I'll tell you a little backstory on him. He actually would go to California to sell goods uh, during the gold rush period and the later periods when they were you know, uh, developing California. And on his way back, his boat that he was on, the ship that he was on hit the infamous Columbia bar and sank and he actually died in that uh, accident there. And so Esther uh, was actually left with herself and the children at that period. And during that time, uh, the Hudson's Bay Company was still in control of the area. And so they actually wanted the shorts off of the North Bank and went to the South, which was American territory. And so there is actually a story that they took uh, Esther and the kids and they put them on the boat in the Columbia and they sent them off. But Esther made it back and she continued to build the city. But we'll get back to the courthouse story here. So the first courthouse was built on October 1st, 1855 at the cost of $440, no expense spared. And it was a frame structure of 30 by 45. It was two stories high and it was locally known as the Red Barn. And so this operated as the courthouse for Clark County. Now, you have a courthouse, you can understand that you probably have a problem. If you prosecute someone, you have a courthouse, where are you going to put them? So originally they would put them in the Hudson's Bay Barracks area, but eventually, three years later, they decided that they needed to build uh, a jail, and the jail was constructed out of log, and that was known as the Log Hut. So we had the Red Barn and the Log Hut as our pillars of justice in the community. Quite interesting. Uh, yeah, West Reserve, 9th and West Reserve. So it was over in that area. Um, but before uh, the prisoners were held at the barracks, and this was the original uh, site of justice for 25 years in the county. Now during 1882, a decision was made to build a new courthouse and the townspeople objected to the continued use of the red barn and the log hut. And so construction of the new courthouse was completed in 1883. Now the second courthouse was an imposing structure uh, uh, frame structure located at 11th and Franklin, 
so much closer to here, uh, just up there, or right, yeah, right in this area, right here, and it costed $44,500. So considerably amount more uh, expense was on this one. And it was described as elegantly fitted with all the accessories calculated to add to the comfort of the public. The rooms were airy and lofty, well-proportioned, conveniently arranged. It was a three-story building with an attic. Unfortunately, the public were not able to enjoy this very long because the structure burnt down seven years later in 1890. Now, Vancouver has quite a history with fire. Most of the business district had been burnt down over and over and over again. And so <laughs> they lost a lot of structures to fire in the early days. And that really, you know, you could say that's why the hidden brick, the hidden family and the brick really started to uh, take hold in the areas because people got tired of the fires. And now most of the records dating back to 1849 were lost in this fire, and this ultimately caused a property dispute between the three largest landholders in the area, the Catholic Church, the Hudson's Bay Company, and the U.S. government. And they uh, would fight over their boundaries over time and time again. Now after the fire on the same property, uh, courthouse number three was built quickly, and this time it was constructed of brick, because they decided they didn't want to deal with the fire, and it was occupied for almost 50 years. And by the 1930s, it was bulging at the seams and everyone was ready for a new uh, courthouse. Several uh, county departments were forced to rent space in other buildings and paperwork was stored everywhere. And it became that the insurance rates to insure that property were so high that nobody could, uh, could really deal with the cost any longer. So that building was torn down and this building was built here by Mr. Hilborn. Now this is earthquake proof, fire proof, all kinds of stuff proof. And they made sure to make it that way because of the remembrance of that courthouse that burnt down and also all of the other fires. We actually lost our first uh, theater, the standard theater in uh, Vancouver to fire. So that theater has gone also because of fire. And then uh, we actually lost an auditorium. We lost an auditorium that we had up near Fort Vancouver High School to fire also. Now the interesting thing is when they built this uh, in a couple years later, they put up this buckskin brigade to show the connection to Vancouver's pioneering history in the area. And in the, uh, in the 70s, there was an overzealous cleaner that actually uh, tarnished the, this piece of art and it was taken down for years and years and years. And so in the early 2000s, a group of individuals named the Buckskin Brigade got the money together to actually refurbish that piece and it's been placed atop the courthouse once again. Now we used to go into the courthouse on our tours, but we don't any longer. But from one of the, one of the inside tours, we have uh, one little story that I can, I can mention to you from here. So this is a courthouse. This isn't the greatest place to end up. And if you look at the, uh, the windows here, you'll see that all the windows have ripples except for one. If you go all the way down, or two right there. If you go all the way down and you look, you see there are two flat glass windows. As I've been told by one of the judges, that was a uh, result of a customer that was unhappy with their service at the courthouse. And so they threw some stuff through the window and the, uh, the, they actually looked everywhere to try to find that same glass, but because it was manufactured so long ago, they were unable, so they just had to replace it with flat glass, which you know, shows you a couple of things about preserving these facilities in a good way, is that sometimes when we lose things, we really lose things. And also it's an interesting story about, you know, how things go in this building at times. From here, we'll head down and we'll take a look at some historic homes. This style was popular uh, uh, in France at a period when they would tax you by story. But what was under the rooftop was not considered a story. So this would be considered a one-story home. So this is ye old tax evasion right here. <laughs> so from that, we'll go ahead and head back and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be done for the tour. And if anyone has any questions, just let me know. The door. Was there like a... I believe it was for furniture. Oh, okay. And I'll just point out as we're walking here, this building to the right, this was a, a Salvation Army, and this was designed by Dave Hilborn. And Hilborn believed so much in the cause of the Salvation Army that he donated most of his services to the architectural design of this building. If you want to continue walking down to the end. So we'll go ahead and stop here for today. And uh, we'll talk about this statue. This is actually not Esther Short. Uh, for most of my life, I thought it was when I grew up here, I thought it was. 
This is actually the Pioneer Mother, and this was just uh, meant to um, show reverence to all the Pioneer Mothers that came to the city of Vancouver and helped uh, establish that. And this statue, uh, Edward Crawford and his wife Ida donated $10,000 to the construction of the fountain at Esther Short Park in, uh, in honor of the Pioneer Mother, which is no longer a fountain, now it's just a statue. And that will conclude our tour for today. Um, next week we will be doing Lower Main and we will be talking about uh, that great fire that I mentioned. And we'll also be talking about the start of business and some businesses and we get to go inside some more places and see uh, some hidden tunnels that are left under Vancouver. So, thank you.